Hey there, and welcome to the talk on chosen ciphertext K-trace attacks on MAST CCA2 Secure Kyber. I'm Sylvan Streit from Fraunhofer Isaac in Munich, Germany, and today I'll present to you work which was conducted together with Mike Hamburg from Rambos Labs, Julius Hermeling from Universität der Bundeswehr München, Robert Primas from Graz University of Technology, Simona Samajiska from Radboud University, Thomas Schamberger from Chio Munich, myself and Emanuele Streeter from Fraunhofer Isaac, and Christine from Fendendal from NXP Semiconductors. In this talk, I'll first go through some backgrounds, present to you our K-Trace attacks followed by our results and conclude with a short conclusion. First, lattice cryptography. A lattice is defined by a basis, by a basis given here as A consisting of the basis vectors. In such a lattice, I can we can define the learning with errors problems, also called LWE. Here it's given as the circuit vector S, which is distorted by a small error vector E. Um, this results in a new vector T, highlighted here in orange. The computation of T with the knowledge of S and E is straightforward. However, going back to S without the knowledge of S or E, with um, going back to S without the knowledge of S or E, with only the knowledge of T is rather tedious. This problem is used in a number of schemes, just to highlight three here. Frodo uses the ring over the integers modulus q with a dimension of n of over a thousand. New Hope uses ring LWE. The ring here is a polynomial ring which allows for faster computation. The polynomials are up to a degree of 1024 and reduced with a reduction polynomial. Kyber adds another level on top of those polynomial rings as, um, as a generalized vector field also called a module. This module is of degree k. k is 2, 3, or 4, depending on the different security levels. k is 2 for Kyber 512, k is 3 for Kyber 768, and k is 4 for Kyber 1024. This vector, generalized vector field still relies on the polynomial ring underneath, with the polynomials being, up to de being of degree 256. On this, Crystal's Kybers defines a key encapsulation method. This first um, starts with Alice generating a uniform basis and then two secret vectors sampled from a small binomial distribution. Um, T is computed from that, as I showed you in the slides before, and published as a public key together with the basis A. Bob then generates a secret key M, which, which they will use in the future communication, and performs again an LWE problem for newly generated R with two error vectors and further embeds this message into, the, into, the, into V. U and V are then sent back as a ciphertext, which Alice can use together with the secret S to recreate, regenerate and uh, recover this message M. You can see that this works uh, down here as the major component cancels and only M re remains with some small error terms which can be neglected. This, of course, leaves out a lot of detail. I want to men mention just one detail, the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, which is important to avoid a chosen ciphertext attack. Um, here, Alice performs again the, uh, the encryption part, as part of the encryption is deterministic, with the knowledge of the message and the public key, to assert that this was an honestly generated ciphertext. Our attack is a side channel attack. So we, um, we assume an attacker that is powerful enough to rec record a side channel. It doesn't to be, need to be such, po such a powerful attacker to open a chip and use electromagnetic measurements. We simply assume an attacker who can measure, do a simple power measurement of, an, of a device and simply record the power consumption of the device while it's computing. With this, we're able to choose our attack um, step uh, as the decryption step before this for, um, before the verification of the ciphertext. So we're attacking this, this multiplication here, and as the ciphertext is verified after this, this um, decryption step is performed, we're able to still perform a chosen ciphertext attack. Let's have a closer look at this um, decryption step. Here we have the multiplication of the secret vector S and the, um, the ciphertext U. Direct computation of this would be um, um, rather slow, so there's already a um, performance optimization built into Kyber using the NTT 
to allow, to allow usage of the convolution theorem. The entity is similar to a, fa uh, to a fast Fourier transform, um, so we're essentially in a Fourier domain or an entity domain in this case, um, which allows to use this point-wise product and improve, improve the complexity from n squared to n log n. Note also, Kaiba uses ciphertext compression, so the ciphertext is not directly transmitted as u, but rather transmitted as c1, which is a compressed um, representation of the ciphertext. So we as an attacker do not have control of the, over the lowest bits of u. Our point of attack is the inverse entity after the pointwise product of the secret key s and our ciphertext u. Let's have a closer look at this inverse entity. This should be familiar, familiar if you've seen the fast Fourier transform before. We have the um, entity domain coefficients on the left side and the regular domain coefficients on the right side. And they're the entity is performed in a butterfly structure, so always pairwise addition and subtraction of the coefficients with a multiplication of the phase. Here we have the butterfly operation between nearest neighbors, here we have them between neighbors with a distance of 2, and here we have them between neighbors with a distance of 4. And the, the phase here is the nth primitive root of unity in the, in the integer field, modulus q. Um, however, normally for this um, polynomial ring you would use the two nth primitive roots of unity. However, Kyber doesn't have a two nth primitive roots of unity in its integer ring. Um, so the entity splits into two half entities of 128 coefficients each. This is a detail that's important for the attack. And so the odd and even coefficients never mix, so we can um, attack and um, consider them separately. However, they mix in the pairwise pointwise multiplication. For the side channel analysis, we, we, um, we assume a similar attack as was used um, in, in previous works. Here we record the leakage at the different points in between the layers. So we assume a leakage during the load and storage operation in between the layers in the PQ clean implementation on the ARM Cortex M4. Um, this uh, was done in previous work by template matching of a Hemingway leakage for the 16 bit signed integer. So to highlight this, um, prior work, especially those two prior works that focus on the NTT by Robert Primat, Peter Pessel, and Stefan Mangard, published in Chess 2017 as a single trace side channel attacks on masked lattice based encryption. Um, they first used the um, a belief propagation network to, uh, to be able to exploit this leakage at different points throughout the NTT. They used uh, this butterfly, they represented this butterfly operation within the entity as a simple factor graph of addition and subtraction within a belief propagation and were thus able to um, combine the different leakage knowledges of the different positions. In their second paper presented in LatinCrypt 2019, they merged those, those factor, factors to a single butterfly factor within each butterfly and further improved performance. Those attacks already were show, this um, paper already showed a practical attack on a Cortex M4. However, the main limitation here was that the noise tolerance with masking was rather low. This brings me to the contributions of this paper. In this paper, we present a no, novel sparse chosen ciphertext attack strategy with a higher noise tolerance. This means we first generate a ciphertext which is sparse in the NTT domain after compression. After decompression, sorry. Um, further, we are able to recover this product of S and U, which I'll call W hat in the following, with a simple side channel leakage of the inverse entity. Um, further, we present an attack strategy how to recover the long term secret S with 1 to K traces um, from this partial knowledge of W hat and a sparse support of U hat. Our attack is further applicable to masked implementations of Kyber as well. And we verified implementation, our attack via an implementation which we'll publish open source. Um, our belief propagation was written in Rust, uh, speed optimized and multi-threaded. And we have a simple Python simulation for the leakages with PQ clean and the further analysis. First, the sparseness. Our inverse entity um, improved, our belief propagation for, of the inverse entity improves drastically by employing sparseness. Sparseness means we, for example, we set every second coefficient here to zero, and this allows us, for example, within these green blocks, 
to only have, have all the leakage values only depend on the signal value. So those three leakage points here all depend on W0 and no, no, other, unknown curve, no other unknown value. So we can combine them straight forward through our belief propagation and throughout the rest of the entity, of course, as well. So the first challenge is to generate those sparse vectors. Um, one straightforward approach was to use the structure of the TT here as well. We want to have something sparse in the NTT domain and we want something compressible on the left side. This is a, um, this is a um, requirement that we need to fulfill in order to be able to send this to a, our victim as Kybert uses this decompression step and we do not have control over the lowest bits. So for this we can use for example, set in an intermediate layer here after layer one, set all coefficients to zero except the first. From this, we already know that the sparseness is, um, is fulfilled as only the top coefficients can be non-zero and all the bottom one will be zero as the top and bottom half never mix after the first half, of, after the first layer of the entity. On the left side, it's only two coefficients which are non-zero also as the, they are the only ones that depend on this intermediate value. And so all we have to do is try all different intermediate values at this point here after the first layer to find something that is compressible on the left side. This is possible down to a quarter of the coefficients for the regular Kyber and even an eighth of the coefficients for Kyber 1024. However, the sparseness is only in contiguous blocks. And to improve on this, our first approach was to rearrange the order of the layers in the NTT which look quite promising as it shifts the sparse net and spreads it throughout our NTT representation. However, this does not change the values, it just promotes the indices and so it doesn't give us a valid NTT output if we just write them in this order. Um, so this was essentially a C fail. So we ha had to resort back to a different solution to use, for example, BKZ as a solver for a shortest vector problem. So for this we can look again at the compression which reduces, um, the, reduces the number of bits to d bits for Kyber 512 and 768 to 10 bits and for Kyber 1024 to 11 bits, q being around 14 bits. So we, um, we have a multiplication by 2 to the power of d and a division by q in a rounding operation. And our requirement is to find something that is sparse in the entity domain and thus, um, and at the same time compressible, so it should be and multiplied by the by 2 to d close to 0 modulus q. So we can write this again as a shortest vector problem modulus q with a sparse support in the NTT domain and this multiplication of 2 to d, 2 to the power of d. Um, we were able to find such solutions using BKC with a block size of 70 or a block size of 80 depending on the different scenarios. Um, with a block size of 70 for all Kyber variants we were able to reduce the number of zeros um, number of non-zeros down to 64 out of 256. For Kyber 1024, we could even use BKC80 to reduce the number of zeros down to 32, as here the compression is a little more relaxed. This takes some uh, some time, only a few minutes, or for the for the 32 non-zero coefficients, a few hours. However, this can be all performed as a pre-computation, as it's independent of the secret key. Now we have the sparseness sorted out. Now we have to recover from this sparse knowledge of our s hat uh, um, coefficients. We have to recover the original s. Again, we can use the, the structure of the NTT. For example, if we know all the coefficients in the top half and we have no knowledge of the bottom half, we can still recover them by simply computing back the last few layers of the NTT as the top and bottom never mix again and then do a small brute force of this single coefficient which only depends on two input variables uh, which are further sampled from a small polynomial, a uh, small binomial. So here the binomial is between minus two and two so it's five different values to the power of two so it's only 25 different value pairs which we have to brute force for each coefficient. For the distributed sparse case, we cannot use again the cannot use the structure of the entity again. We have to resort back to BKZ. But again, here we were able to solve this with BKZ in most BKZ eighty in most cases. However, this requires again some computational time. We only used a Sage implementation here, um, but it um, we showed that it's it's possible. And this is again an offline part of the attack, which can perform can be performed after the traces were recorded. 
Last but not least, how does masking affect our attack? We could not find a masked implementation to verify this with. However, normal cases of masking normally consider masking of the secret. So you have the secret split into two shares and then perform the computation on each of the two shares individually. Our ciphertext is publicly known, so there's normally no need to mask the ciphertext, and thus our sparse vector is multiplied to each of the two shares individually. We can attack both shares independent of another and combine them within the same trace. So our attack is barely affected by masking, as we recover this, the, same, uh, the same coefficients of s hat within the same trace and then combine the traces afterwards once we already know the unmasked coefficients of s hat. Our results, um, first um, we have them for the contiguous sparseness case which is easy to generate and easy to solve afterwards. Here on the y-axis we have the success rate, on the x-axis we have the sigma as the standard deviation of the noise for the 16-bit Hemingway leakage. In the top we have for the masked case, in the bottom we have for the unmasked case. The different lines are for the different number of non-zeros. First we have the blue for the non-sparse case, 256 out of 256 are non-zero. And for example the gray line is the 32 non-zero coefficients which is only applicable to Kyber 1024. The purple line is the most sparse case for the other two Kyber variants which already improves the, already has a non-zero success rate with up to a sigma of 1.2. This, um, just uh, to note also, these values are all average over 25 experiment runs with a 95% 95 conf 95 confidence interval given by the shaded area. By further spreading the sparseness and distributing the sparseness, we are able to shift those graphs further to the right and improving the noise tolerance. Um, so. In the mask case, um, we can have a perf um, almost perfect success rate, uh, a very high success rate um, of for a sigma of 2.2 um, for a Kyber 1024. Note that there's barely any difference between mask and unmask, as masking of the secret key um, of the secret doesn't change our um, attack at all, or barely changes our attack, as we just have to do twice the number of belief propagation graphs. However, each of them um, needs to convolve independently, uh, converge independently. To summarize our results in a final table, um, here we have in the first column we have the sparseness. So first is the most sparse case, which is only applicable to Kyber 1024. And then on the bottom we have the non-sparse case. Our main focus was this K-trace attack here which means for Kyber 512 we need two traces, for Kyber 768 we need three traces, and for Kyber 1024 we need four traces. Why do we need those number of traces? Which each trace we have, uh, we can, we have 64 non-zero coefficients. This means we can recover 64 coefficients of S hat. As S consists, uh, as we need a quarter of the coefficients to recover S within each vector component, we need as many vector components as many traces as we have vector components. So those are the, this is why this k, uh, this number represents the k as the number of vector components in Kyber. With the k-trace attack we can recover with a high success rate of over 70% with a maximum noise tolerance of 1.2 and if we could, uh, and normally you could assume that you can repeat the measurement multiple times if it fails you can increase the noise tolerance up to a noise tolerance of 1.4. For Kyber 1024, we can further go um, have an even sparser case and thus increase the noise tolerance up to a sigma of 2.7 in the 16-bit Hemingway leakage. With a comparison to previous work, first with an unmasked um, case with Peter Pessel's 2019 work, they were able to perform a real attack with a sigma of 1.3. So this means our K-trace attack is viable in a, in a real setting. And further compared to mask simulations before, our sigma definitely exceeds this, whereas the previous work was only up to a sigma of 0.5. Note for those numbers here given in brackets for Kyber 512, as BKC solving for Kyber 512 due to the larger binomial distribution um, is rather um, tedious and takes a lot of computational time of a few days. Um, if you want all of your cases to be solved, it's easy to simply improve, in increase the number of traces by one and then being able to solve it with BKC 40. 
Okay, before we come to a final um, conclusion, let's simply discuss our further applications, further applications to different schemes. For example, New Hope, it's already in an uses an entity, so there the application of the attack would be rather straightforward for different implementation, um, different algorithms. It depends on the implementation. If it uses an entity ring in the implementation, this our attack would be applicable here also. Um, for the other um, cases when using Karatsuba Tom Cook, it might be interesting to further um, investigate whether special sub-blocks exist within Karatsuba Tom Cook to also improve belief propagation here or use it here. Further, we focused our attack on the PQ Clean implementation as this was the similar implementation as used in previous work for comparison. Uh, this already includes lazy reductions like Barrett and Montgomery, which uh, represent a significant improvement in performance. However, PQ, the current PQM4 implementation further includes um, merging of layers and butterflies and 32-bit loads. This makes templating and profiling phase more difficult, which we skipped in our paper as we relied on previous works here. Um, but once you have this sorted out, and for example, you could template the 16-bit multiplications, um, this of course would be more difficult, but then the belief propagation network would look similar as now. Possible countermeasures include, for example, extra masking of the input. As I discussed previous, normally the masking focuses on secrets and not on publicly known variables. However, if you also mask the input, for example, this U hat here, you could complicate our attack as we cannot assume the sparseness within the inverse entity anymore. Further, of course, classical shuffling and hiding mechanisms within the inverse entity, of course, um, would alter our attack and make the templating rather difficult again. To conclude our, my talk on chosen ciphertext K-trace attacks on mass CCA2 secure Kyber, I presented to you a novel sparse CCA, TQ, CCA strategy with a higher noise tolerance than before. This works with a sigma of up to 1.4 or for Kyber 1024 up to a sigma of 2.7. Compared to prior work in a similar setting, this, they only succeeded up to a sigma of 0 0.5. Our attack strategy further um, is applicable to, um, to recover the secret S from 1 to K traces with increasing noise tolerance um, with, the number, with the increasing number of traces. Also, our attack is applicable to masked implementations of Kyber. And if you want to verify for, your, for yourself, you can check out our implementation on GitHub, which we published open source with this paper, um, to verify it. This brings me to the end of your talk. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to contact me or the other authors. And I want to thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.